I think these games just sort of have a legendary quality to them. They're instantly classic. It's been three years already. Since then, an entire world has been built around Five Nights at Freddy's. So much has changed. I still remember thinking to myself way in the beginning, back in 2014, how amazing would it be to make a movie about this? It was September of 2014. Five Nights at Freddy's had been released for about a month. Back in those days, it was still a new game that was only beginning to become infamous. It was growing fast. For a while, it was the biggest thing on the internet. I had found out about the game around this time, after a month of it being out, and after playing it, it changed me. I was at a period in my life where I was trying to make movies but could never really get an idea off the ground. I made a short Slender Man film in 2013, around 30 minutes long, and was trying to put together at the time a feature-length Indiana Jones fan film. I'd invested quite a bit in this project, but in the end it proved to be way too ambitious and difficult. Apologies to everyone I got involved in that. I know better now. I told myself, I need to just find something and stick to it. I knew I had to change my ways of making movies. After experiencing Five Nights at Freddy's, around the time of October 2014, I remember looking at the animatronics and thinking to myself, this is crazy. I feel like I should make a movie about this game. But there's no way that's possible. It's too huge and ambitious. I'll never make it. I kept looking at the animatronics. Their somewhat simplistic design seemed striking. It seemed like something was telling me that I could make the suits of these characters. That idea seemed like a lot of fun. So I went around the house and made a mock-up animatronic hand, using mainly tin foil and hot glue. I then found my bike helmet that I was not using anymore because I hate biking and built onto it the top of Freddy Fazbear's head. I made a jaw and attached it to the sides of the helmet. The jaw was actually movable. And then I went to the fabric store. By the time a week had passed, Freddy Fazbear was now ready. My incentive for completing the suit was, if I can have it ready in time for Halloween, that will be my Halloween costume. Of course, I didn't tell anyone of my true motive for making the suit. I really wanted to see if I could do it. What I had told myself was, if I can make one suit, then I will try to make the others. And if I can make the others, I'll try to make my movie. I came up with a huge idea of making my own set for the pizzeria. I was emptying out my entire room and painting the walls green to make green screens. Thinking back on it, I was crazy getting myself into something that huge so recklessly. I was sort of on a roll, not wanting to stop. I had plans to crowdfund the film. I went crazy with promoting the film on Facebook, primarily. Not long after I had made my Freddy Fazbear suit and started all this work, I changed schools. This was perfect. My new school gave me much more free time. You see, I switched from a private school to a public school. Everything seemed to be lining up just right for me to go forward with this project. All the while I was doing this, it suddenly occurred to me. I don't have a script. January 2015, I officially announced I was making the film online. I pushed myself to release something for the public to actually see, a small hint of the film to come. I put together a trailer using the Freddy Fazbear suit and some other props as well, such as the original version of Carl the Cupcake, which was definitely not the best compared to what I had in the final movie. The trailer met with pretty good reception, although now it's very dated. I've since made the trailer unlisted, as I feel it does not represent the final film. But I remember having a blast putting it together for the public to see. I announced it in front of my classes, and got a small gathering out of people I knew as the start of an audience. 
It was exciting, but kind of scary at the same time. I met a bunch of new people who helped me get the project off the ground. Among these people was my eventual script co-writer. While I was announcing the project, most people didn't believe I was really doing this. It's easy to just say you're going to make something, but I was serious about this. One person did believe me, my co-script writer. We agreed to keep the plot completely secret from the public. And then, we began to write the script. By now, Five Nights at Freddy's 2 had been released, and so we had a gold mine of new things to write about. This was back in the day, before we knew the identity of the Purple Man, before Springtrap was revealed, and before the series got more confusing, essentially. Our starting point with developing the story was... Who is Mike Schmidt? In the game, the character is a blank slate. He's the player. You. You invent his story. You live out what he's feeling throughout your five nights at Freddy's. We had to figure out who he was, why he would get a job at Freddy's, and why he would stay there for five nights. We decided to have Mike have some sort of family connection with an incident that happened at Freddy's. Initially, in the first draft, Mike was the son of the Bite of 87 victim, his mother. Mike would be 12 or 13, and we would cut to 1993, which would have him be an adult looking for a job. At the time, I was trying to cast a teenager to play Mike, so this lined up right. We had a few problems though. How does this answer why he wants a job, and why would he stay at said job at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza? If anything, he would want to stay away from the place. We refused to let it be a boring excuse for him to be working there, such as he wanted to get a job, or he needed money. We had to make it more dynamic and heavily tied to the core plot. We went back to the drawing board. Our next idea was to make Mike be at the pizzeria with his little brother. Mike would be in his late teens, early 20s in this version, and his brother would be between 7 to 12 years old. We decided to have him get taken away by the Purple Man, the game franchise's killer. This would occur in 1987, and then we would go six years afterwards, where Mike would get a job at the new Freddy's. But then, I had to stop myself again. Why not start the film with the incident, and have Mike get his job right after, becoming the security guard to find the killer right after the incident happened? At this point, the idea seemed perfect. We knew who Mike was now. We knew why he would get a job at Freddy's, and we knew why he would stay because he would gradually learn more about the incident. Mike finding out details would be the bulk of the movie. It was perfect. Add in some between night scenes with Jeremy Fitzgerald, the alleged bite victim Mrs. Scott, and Mike's inner conflict and struggles to find his answers, and we had ourselves a full-fledged script that only took a few more drafts to be perfect. When we were writing the script, we knew there were certain things we couldn't omit from the story. One of which was the security guards from the second game, Jeremy Fitzgerald and Fritz Smith. These felt like key characters that could add something new and interesting to the story. We decided that to add tension to the film, we would make all the previous security guards get killed by the Purple Man, except for one, Jeremy. It seemed like the right decision to have Mike eventually cross paths with Jeremy. Jeremy could teach Mike about what is really going on, about his experience with the killer. It was a cool idea to make Jeremy a little more paranoid and careful than Mike, seeing as he doesn't know if he is still wanted dead or not. Of course, he is. We wanted there to be a character to slap some sense into Mike, to try and make it more tempting for him to give up this insanely dangerous mission he was on. I had tried to make a lot of buzz surrounding the scene where the Purple Man would be revealed at Fred Bear's family diner. It would be a turning point in the film, one where Jeremy would die and Mike would be faced with the gruesome reality of the mess he was in. At the time the first film was being made, William Afton, Michael Afton, and Henry were all unknown meaningless names. This was long before the book series had been launched. 
All we had to go on was that there was a purple sprite in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 representing the killer of the series. Or so we assume. Some people thought he was the phone guy. Some people thought he was Mike. Some people thought he was someone we didn't know. It was a mystery. And we took full advantage of this. At first, we were going the conventional route, having the phone guy be the purple man. There was going to be a dark ending where Mike would actually die, and the purple man would get his way stuffing Mike into the springtrap suit, reversing what we would expect to happen. But having the purple man be the phone guy seemed too... unoriginal. It was rather uninteresting to go off one of the more popular theories at the time. This was our film universe, so we could do what we wanted. It was a really interesting idea to make the Purple Man be a face we didn't know, a character we hadn't explicitly seen in the film beforehand. He was alluded to, there were hints pointing to his identity, but in the end, I think it was a surprise for everyone. We made him be the first disappearance from the five missing children, because it was an interesting and different idea to make the killer actually be one of the children who disappeared. This meant we did have to sacrifice Golden Freddy, which was unfortunate, but we wanted to take the film in a new and unexpected direction. Golden Freddy was in previous drafts of the movie. A suit was going to be made for him, and essentially he would be the animatronic that the Purple Man would be disguised under throughout the film. On top of being the first disappearance, he was also the son of who we thought was the bite victim of 87. From the very start, this was planned to be a red herring. A misleading, false, covered up story. As far as his design went, I thought to myself, I can make him look like anything. I kept the color purple in mind, giving him purple gloves. I then decided to simply make him a masked and hooded, knife-wielding figure. I had an old mask from my 2011 Halloween costume. A Jawa. I put his look together, and it turned out to work really great for the movie. I made a short second teaser for the film revealing his design to see how people would react to it. The reception was great. I knew we had our purple man. One thing I absolutely wanted to honor was the animatronic gang from Five Nights at Freddy's 1. These animatronics had to look like their in-game counterparts, but with a few little design choices made by myself to add something more personal to the characters. Freddy's fur color had changes. Bonnie was a deeper purple with ears that flopped down instead of sticking up. Chica would not have her cupcake on a plate and Foxy would be overall smaller in stature. I also took the very conscious decision to not have them talk at all in the film, just like in the games. They stayed mute. In earlier versions of the script, they were going to talk in an alternate version of the nightmare sequence that Mike has near the beginning of the movie, but it wasn't working. It would just be better if they didn't talk. The final decision I made as far as changes was to have them slink around like creatures rather than mechanically move from place to place. I wanted them to really feel alive. After making the three costumes for Freddy, Bonnie, and Chica, and after making the four foot puppet for Foxy, it seemed like animatronic wise we had everything covered. Until... Five Nights at Freddy's 3 had released in the beginning of March while pre-production was still going underway. This essentially threw a monkey wrench into our script. We could not simply ignore Springtrap, or the fact that whoever the Purple Man was in the games, he was killed inside the Spring Bonnie suit that turned into Springtrap over time. A newer, more complete draft of the film was made. We made the decision to have Mike be in the life-or-death situation at the end of the film, with the Purple Man threatening to stuff him into a Spring Bonnie suit, making him be the eventual Springtrap. 
At the last second, justice would be served, and the killer would die in the suit, like in the games. The film was always planned to have a big confrontation scene between Mike and the killer, but now I had the perfect idea for the scene. I also kept in mind that in the third game, the Purple Man dismantles the four main animatronics. I decided to have Mike do this in the film as a big action set piece for the end, because it would also foreshadow what would end up happening to Mike in the second film. He had a little bit of Purple Man in him. It was at this point that I also had taken the decision to not have the Purple Man be one specific man, but actually a label associated with someone who killed in the name of Freddy's. Over the two films, there have technically been three Purple Men. David Afton, the original, William Afton, and Mike Schmidt. This is also a nod to how the Purple Man looks different every time we see him in the game series. At last, it seemed as though the story was finally complete for the film. After a lot of reworking, adding in new lore, and making slight changes, we finally ended up with the story you see on screen today in Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film. Let's backtrack a little. It's one thing to have a script, but you have to be able to bring it to life with real, tangible sets, costumes, and actors. This part of filmmaking is the most fun in my opinion, but it can prove to be quite the challenge to get everything you need to be in the film. With Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film, it was a crucial thing to cast the right person to play Mike Schmidt. I didn't want to do it myself because it was not a fitting role and I also didn't want to occupy the lead role. I did a lot of searching at school and ended up with no one to play the security guard. The problem is, at that time, I had nothing to show. This was my first real feature film I really stuck with through to the end. Eventually it clicked. My brother Johan was the perfect age and had the perfect look to play the character of Mike Schmidt. Thankfully, he accepted the role. Mike was finally cast. The next thing was the animatronics. Anyone can be under those suits. I insisted on keeping the role of Freddy as the suit was made for me to my measurements. I knew that the people who would be playing the other animatronics had to be people who loved the games and had what it takes to bring the characters to life. At school, I was friends with the perfect group of people for the job. And so, Bonnie and Chica's suits were made on measurement, and we had a second operator for Foxy, who would be the main puppeteer. Over time, the rest of the characters in the film found their actors. Mrs. Scott was played by my mom, Mike's friend on the phone was played by Nico, who was an actor we had the privilege of having in both films, Jeremy was played by my older brother, Janik, and the ghost child was cast as well. We were all set. Now, speaking of sets, from the start of the project, I felt it was super important to have the most authentic set for the film of the office from the first game. I had never had experience with building a film set from scratch before, so with the help of a few folks who knew a thing or two about construction, I was ready to start building. I took my measurements, and then I took a trip to Rona and bought 26 styrofoam boards that would be the walls of the final set. It cost a pretty penny, but it could have been more expensive. I was going to make it out of wood initially, but I didn't realize just how brutally expensive that would be compared to styrofoam as a cheaper alternative. I also found the most accurate looking desk and desk fan that I could, and had the Celebrate poster printed out in large format. I used a special metallic wallpaper to give the walls their metallic look they have in the games. I filled the middle part of the walls with individually cut tiles to match the black and white motif in the game. A few screws and a lot of duct tape later, and the office was starting to take shape. I realized that the room the office would be built in realistically would have about enough space to make the office as well as the two hallways on either side of it. The small amount of space behind the office and between the hallways would serve as the green screen booth. A small space which had the green wall exposed inside for scenes such as the ghost encounter near the end of the film. The building of the set took around four months. By the time it was over, I was thrilled with the final result. 
It was an experience I'll never forget. I had officially begun the heavy production of the film back in January of 2015. I had in mind the goal of having everything I needed in the film complete by the time the school year would be over and summer would begin. I would shoot everything over that two months worth of summer. Everything had worked out in the end. We were ready for filming. I had a target release of October 2015, Halloween more specifically. I thought it would be the perfect release date. However, things had not gone quite as planned. Yoen turned out to be extremely busy over that time. A much smaller amount of footage was completed than planned. Filming would end up taking much longer. We gave ourselves another year of production. As the year unfolded, certain dates in particular were filming days. It was a spare shoot throughout the year. Eventually, I decided to reveal the release date, my own birthday, June 24th, for the theatrical release, and June 25th for the online release. This was now our true, final deadline. No exceptions. Filming got more intensive as time went on. During the month of June in particular, there were long shoot days where a lot of scenes would be tackled at once. It eventually all culminated to June 19th, the final filming day. Bits from six scenes were filmed on that day. My brother Janik came down to film as it was the one day he was available before June 24th. We filmed at several different locations. In the end, it was an insanely hectic day. Hey, this is Liam here. Very tired. <laughs> Today is the last day of principal photography. Uh, I've filmed for many hours today, and this is finally going to be the last scene. By the end of the day, I was relieved, but felt a new terror creeping in on me. Okay, okay everyone. So, uh, okay, well, before I start, I just want to say thanks to like all of you who, who came to see this movie. Like, what good is a movie without a great audience to see it, you know? So, um, tonight, we're going to be watching a little movie that's based on a little video game franchise that may have, you know, taken the world by storm when it came up. And that video game franchise is Five Nights at Freddy's. Some of you might know. <laughs> so, um, ever since I started being a fan of this, back in like September of 2014, I always told myself, you know, I really want to see a movie of this. Like I want to be able to go to a theater and just see it on the big screen. And I told myself, well, no movie studios, no movie studios are gonna do that for a little while unless it, like, they get a deal with Warner Brothers, uh, which actually <laughs> happened. That kind of stressed me out when it happened, but yeah, anyway. So I told myself, what better person to make a movie for myself, who was an aspiring filmmaker with several failed projects. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so I told myself, for this one, this one's going to be special. I'm not going to stop until the whole thing is done, and I don't care how long it takes. It's going to be feature length, and it's going to be awesome. So after 18 months of hard work and just determination, I finally have it done, so without further ado, I have one question for you. Are you ready for Freddy? <laughs> <laughs> On June 24th, 2016, Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film, hit my local cinema. It was the first time I would ever be able to see my own work on the big screen. It was an amazing day and a true privilege to see it like this upon its release. People had enjoyed the film a great deal, and so this was relieving to see. I would celebrate my 17th birthday and release the film officially online the day after at 12 p.m. As much of a relief as it was, part of me was not happy yet. The film did not end up how I intended, and I knew there was room for something more. I always intended for it to have a proper conclusion to the story. At the end of the film, there is an after credits scene. This scene would only make sense 
once the film's sequel would be released. After that scene, a message appeared, stating, Freddy and his friends will return in 2017. During the time of the end of the film's production, I was also getting to know my soon-to-be best friend, Michelle. She was helping me to create the 8-bit credit sequence at the end of the film, and she also provided the voice of the news reporter from the beginning of the film. I wasn't prepared for how such a simple thing we were doing for the movie would eventually lead to an amazing friendship, and a second movie. The truth is, I would not have made the second movie if she was not on board to play the lead. The movie wouldn't have worked without her. Around May of 2016, I was toying around with the idea of a sequel. I always had the idea in the back of my mind, but somewhat dismissed it because would I really want to put myself through this again? But as Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film, was coming into fruition, I more and more felt it was absolutely necessary to tell the end of the story. There was so much untapped potential, so much more to tell, and so much to explore with Five Nights at Freddy's 3. And so, Fazbear's Fright, the fan film, had technically begun production during the month before the first film's release. My starting point with the film was, once again, who is the security guard? But the thing with Five Nights 3 is, we know nothing about the security guard. We don't even know if it's a man or a woman. Wait, that's it. What if the security guard is a woman? And not just any woman, but none other than the daughter of Mike Schmidt. The timelines added up perfectly. And now I could finally create that interesting twist in Mike's character. I felt like I had an amazing conflict to explore in the film. I was in business. A new movie was beginning to form. I asked Michelle if she would be willing to commit to playing the lead character. Thankfully, she said yes. At this point, I was ready to really start developing this new film, which would surpass the original in so many ways. Hi, uh, it's Michelle. I played the journalist in the first film. In the second film, I played Jamie Schmidt. I made pixel art in both films, and I also co-made the second film. I'd like to start by talking about the beginning of all of this from my end. I was always the new kid at school, so I knew how it felt. So when I spotted Liam for the first time as he was getting the tour at school, I was determined to welcome him. I was excited when I found out that we had a study hall class together. I sat next to him and introduced myself. We clicked right away. I noticed his amazing drawings of Freddy Fazbear. This led us to talking about his amazing movie that he wanted to make. Of course I heard about this and was amazed at his ideas and his skill. I wanted to help as much as I could. I barely knew him, but I knew that this movie and our future friendship would be awesome. The first time I went over to his place was to record the voice of the journalist. We hadn't known each other very long, maybe a month. We were still meeting each other and it was a little awkward, but then I met his mom and I saw his house and I quickly felt at home. A few months later, we became inseparable. We had both been a part of each other's family dinners, I was over almost all the time, and we just had a lot of fun hanging out. We played video games, we watched shows, and we worked on the movie. I have been so honored to not only be friends with this amazing and talented guy, but also get to help, act, and make two movies with him. When he told me he wanted to make a second movie, I was so excited. I was shocked and lost for words when he asked me if I could co-make it and star in it. We spent a lot of time laughing through all the struggles that happened. I would never have been able to get through some of the roadblocks if it wasn't for my best friend. By this point, Five Nights at Freddy's 3 and 4 had been released, with Sister Location closely on its way to being released. Because of this, I took a precaution I hadn't taken with the first film. I crafted the story to specifically be centered around Five Nights at Freddy's 3 and 4, and I left the character of Charlie open to being the thing in the movie that could touch on Sister Location as well as the book The Silver Eyes. I had read The Silver Eyes upon its release, 
As a matter of fact, I got the book December 17th, 2015, and started reading it right on its release date. There was a plethora of new characters I could incorporate into the new film, but I had to stop myself. I told myself I can use the names of the characters and have hints of their roles in the books be in the film, but I cannot copy them straight from the book, and they have to be relevant to the plot. I was taking big precautions while writing this new film, being as careful as I could. I told myself I can't begin the production until after Sister Location has released, because once that game would be released, I could adapt the screenplay to include elements from it, and be completely safe and able to really start a steady, secure production that was not subject to any major changes. October 7th rolled around. Sister Location released, and me and Michelle played through all of it that evening. We were given the green light to really kick things into gear. Michelle and I agreed to start filming sometime in October. Let's backtrack a bit though. The second film story would be a trickier thing to tackle. We had the books and sister location covered, but now how do we incorporate Five Nights 3 and 4 to the main plot of the film, which is the continuation of the first film? How does Mike Schmidt play into all of this? What kind of relationship could be explored between Springtrap and Jamie? While I was wrapping up Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film, I had toyed around with the idea of Mike having a bit of Purple Man in him. There were also hints planted all throughout the film that Mike had just had a child, specifically a daughter. With Mike's character, I thought to myself, logically, if he would have lost his younger brother around the time of his daughter being born, he would be very overprotective of his daughter. On top of it, Mike suffers trauma throughout the first film. I thought it was a very interesting idea to explore what trauma plus overprotectiveness could do to a person. I thought, maybe this could drive Mike mad. It could drive him to run away from his responsibilities, and it could drive him to want to destroy anything related to the thing that traumatized him, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. This character development opened a gateway for Jamie's character. What would the daughter of a father who abandoned his child think of her father? Mike Schmidt passed into legend as the man who stopped all the horrors at Freddy's. But Jamie wouldn't see him as a hero. She would instead see him as a monster. And so, the real meat of the plot came to me with this plot point. What if Jamie finds out about this place called Fazbear's Fright the horror attraction. She could see it as the first real lead to finding her dad ever. And so she could venture out to Hurricane Utah, the location from the Silver Eyes, meet up with her old friend Charlie, and begin her search. The movie was really starting to take shape. There was one very important character that needed to have his narrative arc completed. At the end of Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film, the Purple Man, now known to be William Afton, in the film universe was hinted to having a dark backstory. During his moment of death, the puppet comes forward to communicate something to him. Right as this is happening, we can see a glimpse of the real William, before he went crazy. His slow death was making him realize what was really important in his life. But it was too late for him, unfortunately. There was no way for him to undo the past. He was punished with being physically alive until he could tangibly redeem all the evil he had done. His mind would be trapped in the netherworld, chained to a wall, and his body would be forced to remain alive, suffering in the former Spring Bonnie suit. In this film, I had to have his character arc be completed, which would mean he would have to redeem himself by the end. I thought that the perfect way to approach this concept would be to have Jamie build on him, as well as the other way around. These two characters would grow as they suffer through horrible things at the same time, eventually setting things right by the end of the film. I also had the amazing and fan-favorite animatronic Springtrap to explore in the movie universe. My golden rule with him, as to be careful and portray him as perfectly as I could, was to have everything he does be linked to the person in the suit. To me, Springtrap was never just a scary bunny animatronic. This was how I saw him before playing Five Nights at Freddy's 3, but by the time the game was over, my view on him had changed. Springtrap was a real person, 
And in my film universe, a real person who suffered great injustice and was forced into making very bad decisions that led to his fate. I wanted to show how angry Springtrap would be initially upon first meeting Jamie. He would see her as a threat, and as another thing that's trying to get him. Afterwards, I wanted to show that as Jamie meets William in the Netherworld and helps him in his redemption, upon waking up in the real world again, Springtrap has changed. In the end of the film, I really tried my best to give off an impression that Springtrap, or rather William, really understood Jamie and the other way around as well. Off screen, we can figure out that he dragged Jamie out of the building to set it on fire. He walks out and waves goodbye to Jamie and watches the most important person in his life disappear forever. My goal was really for the audience to sympathize with Springtrap after being afraid of him. It's all a matter of context and perspective. I also tried to fit in as much of the lore as I possibly could into this film, as to answer every single question there could be. I touched on the box from the fourth game, the founders of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, and the business side of the story, sister location, the silver eyes, and every other little morsel I could fit in. There was one final thing I had to do to make the story complete. I had to create a new character to tie up Mike and Jamie's respective character arts. Lock Bunny was my way of having Mike Schmidt remain hidden. I wanted to have a new age purple man, and so I gave him an axe as a weapon, the signature purple gloves, and a Springtrap inspired mask made from a potato sack. The idea was to show how that confrontation between Mike and William in the first film really messed with Mike's head and was burned into his brain. He could not get the image of a killer bunny out of his head. Of course, Jamie would have to end up dead in the netherworld for the story to progress. So I thought, wouldn't it be really spectacular if I reversed the roles from the first film? What if Jamie had the same confrontation Mike had with the purple man in the first film, only this time, Mike would be the one in the antagonizing role? And as a twist, Jamie would actually die from this encounter. I feel that in the film, it made for the most emotional scene out of all of them. Filming had to begin in October, like I had mentioned earlier, and so it was now October. We gave ourselves the goal of having a teaser out by Christmas, and we began filming. I approached this movie's production in a more experienced and careful way than with Five Nights at Freddy's, the fan film. Essentially, the big challenge this time around would be the scale of the movie. There would have to be the whole Fazbear's Fright part of the movie, but I made a conscious decision to not have the main focus of the movie be on these parts. They would be big set piece scenes, of course, but the characters were driving everything, and so I felt it was much wiser, and more different, and original, to have the Charlie subplot, the business subplot, and the foreshadowing of Mike's turn to be the true important parts of the first half. On that note, the film was divided into two blocks of production. Jamie's death would be the turning point of separation between the two. Everything before her death would be part of block one, and everything after, block two. This way, it wasn't too overwhelming, and we could focus on one block at a time as a better way to tackle the production. This movie required a much larger cast, and many more locations than the first. Finding the locations wasn't the worst of our troubles, in fact, we managed to do a pretty good job of finding good, filmable places. Our first location for day one of filming was the cornfield from scene 25. We would have to film that first, as the cornfield closed for a year after Halloween. My dad had found an abandoned little structure in the woods near where he lived. He called me one day and said that he found something really cool that we could use as a filming location. He was very involved with the production of his character scenes in particular. One day, I went with him and saw the location in person and thought it was absolutely ideal for where David Afton could be spending his days after his business failed and he went into hiding. The trickiest scene location-wise was definitely the restaurant scene at the beginning of the movie. We were five cast and crew that would have to film in a noisy restaurant, and turns out the restaurant we were going to film at was packed the day we were shooting! We had to quickly go with a plan B restaurant, which thankfully worked. 
I was very tired after that day, but thankful as hell that we got all the footage we needed. The casting of the film was one of the more difficult problems to tackle. By the time we were in pre-production, we had the following characters cast. Jamie, Evan, William, David, Carlton, Jason, John, and Mike. A decent amount of characters, a good start, but key characters still had to be cast. Some of the most important were missing. We had an uncertain answer for Michael Afton's actor, because it was far in the future after we had asked him that you would be filming, because all of his scenes are in block two. Thankfully, Zack was able to play him. We also had the problem of who would play Charlie, a key character in the film who we initially had an actress for, when suddenly she dropped out right before we were going to film with her. We were at a loss of ideas for what to do. I contacted as many people as I could. I thought I had another actress, but it turns out she couldn't play her because she was too busy and didn't have enough time. Finally, it was almost by accident. I noticed Michelle was texting a girl I didn't recognize, and I had never heard of her before, so I asked her, could she maybe play Charlie? She showed me a picture of this girl, and she looked exactly how I pictured Charlie while reading The Silver Eyes. It was actually uncanny. This was late in the game, however. We had been filming for a little while and holding off Charlie's scenes. We had to write her out of an office scene and had to make a whole lot of other compromises. In the end, it worked, and that's what's important. It would have been really unfortunate if we didn't have Charlie in the movie, because I think she adds another layer of depth that wouldn't be there if she wasn't there. On to creating the looks of the characters. I did all the makeup, even the small details. Makeup-wise, Zach, who played Michael Afton, took the most prep. My makeup for Jamie Schmidt is just a simpler version of my own day-to-day -day makeup. Zach, though, is a redhead, which means we had to use hair coloring spray each time on all of his hair which itself was messy, so there was a lot of cleanup. Plus, I had to draw on his eyebrows since his own are so pale they barely show up on camera. Fake blood was tricky to work with because once it dries, it gets pale, thin, and flaky, which means a lot of touch-ups. It was uh, the same on costumes as well. If we put a bunch of blood onto one of the animatronics or onto my bloody shirt, I had to touch it up every time that we'd start filming again. For block one, right out of the gates we thought we were on top of everything, but we ran into a roadblock. We had only filmed a few scenes and only started building the office set when my brother announced he was moving in with his family. This completely disrupted everything in the production, and suddenly we had only a few weeks to film a monumental amount of work for such a small production. It felt like the world was crumbling around us while we were scrambling to get the content made. As soon as filming in the office would be complete, we had to immediately destroy the set. It was unsalvageable afterwards in case of emergency footage, so I had to film as many insert shots as I could, and then I had to take down everything. It was a big blow for me and Michelle. Another significant problem with Block 1 was that it's on a technical level much denser than the second half of the movie. There are significantly more characters, locations, and small details to keep track of. We had to get the first half right for the second half to have the impact it was supposed to have. It was to a point that Block 1's filming turned out to be 80% of the total time we filmed the movie. Block 2 was a much faster shoot. Block 1 had so many inconveniences, such as several actors being needed at certain places, while said actors are working for free, so are not obliged to be there, and so on. If we had the budget to pay our actors, the film would have been completed much faster. And same goes for the first film. While we were filming, there was one more roadblock that really did a number on us. I just completed the final scene with my dad, the one where his character talks with William, revealing the Purple Man's origin story. A few days later, my brother came over to deliver some sad news. My father passed away on March 22nd, and that last filming day I spent with him would be the last time I saw him. The news was unreal to hear. 
it was really devastating and a shock for all of us. At this point, I had an epiphany. Now, there is no excuse for not completing the film. Now, it has to be completed. Is my way of honoring my father. The film was now dedicated to him. All of his scenes were completed, and he had a chance to review the footage on the day of filming each time. I'm glad he had the chance to see his scenes in the first feature film he would be a part of. After such a serious turn of events, production turned even more serious. It was no longer a project for fun, it was a mission. This thing had to be completed. As everything was becoming harder in production, we finally completed all the footage. Principal photography was officially concluded on May 31st, 2017, and I had 24 days until release to put together the movie in post-production. This time, I had enough time, and I was essentially on a huge adrenaline rush for that month. Hey guys, Liam here. Uh, here we are, June 5th, first day of editing the real movie. So, um, I've been waiting a long time for this day. <laughs> like, I've never worked so hard on anything in my life. You have no idea what it was like to get the footage for this movie. Like, basically anything that could go wrong over the course of filming a movie has gone wrong. Regardless, uh, so, uh, the, the important thing is that I'm editing. I'm, I'm here, I'm just, like, not really giving a crap how I look today. Like, I'm just wearing a BB-8 shirt and, like, pajama pants. <laughs> and, uh, I just kind of, uh, well, I have, like, a bunch of notes kind of just lying around everywhere. Uh, some of this is for the trailer, some of this isn't. I got Carl watching over me. And, uh... Lying about is uh, basically my fuel for getting this thing done. Anyways, um, I'm gonna get to it like right away because I got a lot of work to do, and I have 20 days. Because, like I said, it is June 5th. So, uh, come on, come on. There you go. It is nope. There you go. It is June 5th. Editing this movie would be a much more terrifying idea than the first movie's editing stages, because this felt like a more complete, all-around complex movie. I would have to put as much time as possible to making it perfect. We'd worked on it for so long and so hard, so we knew we had to get it right in the editing. I gave myself a deadline of two weeks, to have enough time to give the film to the theater early enough to assure that everything would work properly. As it turns out, editing would have a whole slew of problems, just like the other two stages of production. It seemed like this movie was cursed. To start off with, my computer was getting slower by the day. It was essentially on its deathbed by the time editing was over. The footage would not play properly on almost every clip, and sometimes Premiere Pro would freeze, needing a cold boot to fix the problem. I also mistakenly closed the work window a few times, which is incredibly easy to do, as the hotkey is one key off from the one you use to save your project. The same thing is true for going into the file menu to physically click on the save button. It's right under the save button. It takes nothing for you to accidentally close that work window, and you cannot reopen it. You have to open an auto-save project from hours ago. Moments like this were crushing. I put extra emphasis on sound design making sure that it would be as creepy and realistic as possible. I carefully selected the sounds each animatronic would make, even recording noises of my own for Springtrap in particular. It was crucial to get this right to make it more immersive for the viewer. The nightmare animatronics have the sounds of their real counterpart animals or animals close to them. Plush Trap has raccoon sounds, as a raccoon is a small, vicious animal, just like Plush Trap is. And Fredbear is a whole mix of roaring animals like tigers, bears, etc. 
I had help from around the world with the production of this film. My good friend Claudio provided the voice of Balloon Boy, and him and his friend created a completely original episode of Sister Locations, The Immortal and the Restless. As the clouds gathered on this summer's day, so do the emotions of once there is a soulmate. Excuse me, sir? That voice. I recognize it. I would like to order a... Uh... Hey! You think you're so sneaky, Vlad? Clara, my love. I do not know who you speak of. Now, what kind of taco would you like? Don't lie to me, Vlad. A complete stranger wouldn't call someone my love. I knew there was a reason you kept leaving the house every night. Please, Clara, my darling. You must understand. I must work the graveyard shift to be able to support my family. You and my baby. Who is not mine, by the way. You fool! We'll see who's laughing soon. I'm gonna go back to the house that you're paying for and lighten things up a little. Ha ha! You do that, Clara. The house has been sucking lately. I would love you to bring in some positive vibes. Was that a vampire joke? Please, my love. There are more hungry customers who wish for a late night snack. I must tend to them. Will Vlad get enough money in his paycheck to support the house? Is the baby trolley his? All of this and more next time. It was such a cool thing to have in our movie, and I have to applaud Claudio and Ciro for their awesome contributions to the movie. It was a pleasure working with them, and I'm definitely planning to work with them on future projects. At last, it seemed like the nightmare was coming to an end. All that remained was finalizing the end credits 8-bit sequence, similar to the one in the first film. Pixel art always took at least an hour apiece. Backgrounds of characters are also never made together, which means you also have to make sure characters could fit into the scene properly. Liam was the editor of the pixel art. He made it so that they were sort of a video game where you, he controlled the characters to move around the prop sets properly. And it made a beautiful, beautiful credit scene. Once all of that was done, we did a test screening with Yoan to get a few final notes on minor changes we had to make for the final cut of the movie. Three simple edits later, and the film was officially 100% completed. We put out the final trailer, and June 24th was coming around fast. A gathering of people would be coming to see the world premiere of the film, once again at my local theater. I dressed up in the suit my dad got me for the year before and prepared a simple speech. I wanted to let Michelle do most of the talking. The cinema told me the film played perfectly, problem free. It would play at 5.30 in the evening. Everyone was running around getting things ready and finally that magical moment came when we were in the theater room ready to unveil the film. It was one of the proudest days of my life. After one year of making props, making sets, making just this movie, in, it's been insane. It's been a really tough journey, but we've made it this far. And we're so excited to show you everything that we've worked on. Uh, thank you very much for everyone who has supported us throughout the whole thing. Thank you for our beloved actors. And thank you for the parents who gave us rides. Uh, yeah, and I just want to say that I was so honored to work with my best friend through this whole project. And I am so proud of him for getting his second movie done. The first movie is almost at 51,000 views on YouTube, so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're hoping that this one will be even greater success. So I will pass you to him. Great. Um, 
No, I think she covered all the, the thank yous <laughs> and all that. So um, I'm just going to get straight to the point. Um, so uh, this, this movie, um, while I was filming, uh, I, I had the pleasure of having my dad be in some of the scenes. And uh, he got a chance to look over the footage. So he has seen the footage and he's very happy with it. And uh, I think he would have really enjoyed the movie. So this movie is now in honor of him. And uh, I hope you all enjoy. My last three years of my life have been devoted to making the dream of seeing a real Five Nights at Freddy's movie come true. I never thought it would go this far. I got to have my first experience in making complex feature films that had real plots, and in the end, I managed to overcome a mountain of challenges. I've met people along the way that have changed my life and I've lived through some very important things throughout the making of these two films. That is why they'll always hold a special place in my heart. I don't consider this to be the beginning of my filmmaking works, but rather the appetizer. It's just a taste of what's to come. It's preparation for the bigger, even more ambitious projects that I will take on in the coming years of my life. These two films helped me transition from an amateur to an aspiring, serious filmmaker who has a goal of making this craft my career. Thank you to everyone who has helped me along the way. I'm glad to have made something you can enjoy. And I promise you, I won't disappoint you with what's to come. As for now, this concludes my shift at Freddy Fazbear's Pizza.